in my service, I would wait until my release should come. You would call and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. For then you would not number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag and you would cover over my iniquity. And then we're going to turn to uh, Luke's gospel and into the 23rd chapter, reading from verse 39 to 43. And this is the story that I told to the children. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I appreciate that uh, Joel invited me to come back and uh, preach here once again. That's usually a good sign uh, when you get to come back. Although he's never here when I preach, so how would he know anyway, right? Uh, So we want to think about Psalm 25 this morning. There are very few things in life I would submit to you today worse than being forgotten or overlooked, yeah? I was, uh, my father has, uh, is very unwell. In fact, he was just declared palliative last week, so we're in the last days with him. Uh, But uh, I went out to Vancouver. I'd sort of sent out an an update to some of my friends about what was going on, and I ran into an old friend and and uh, I realized I had forgotten to include her on this list. Um, and, uh, and I told her, and I apologized. She said, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it. But I sort of detected, you know, a, a hint of sadness there, a, a little sense of, oh, I got forgotten. I felt badly, I, because I've been there. Haven't you been there, you know, when there's been a party and you haven't been invited, or someone sent out something and, and, and you did not get remembered. Somebody forgot you. It's not a good feeling. And my guess is that most of the time it hasn't been intentional. It's not as if someone deliberately erased you from their memory. You know what happens in relationships, right? It's more like slow attrition, you know. uh, Details slip and fade and time goes by and there's no communication. And next thing you know, there's no holding place left for you or the place that you had in a life or that someone had in your life. And I think that one could argue that we spend a lot of our lives trying to ensure that we will not be forgotten. Working hard. We work hard to leave a legacy. Have you never sat in a funeral and listened to the eulogy and thought to yourself, I wonder what they're going to say at my funeral. And then you go out and you try and do some things that will, you know, sort of put you in a better light, yeah? Sure, we've all done that. We want to have a legacy. We want, we want people to speak well of us at the end, or even before the end. It would be a good thing too, wouldn't it? You do not want to be forgotten. So we spend a lot of time working on that. And these days, we've been given a new means by which to ensure our place in people's imaginations. And it's called social media. Our culture has swept us into a, the tide of self-promotion giving us the means by which we can publicize our activities and views on just about anything we like. And so the advent of social media means that there is more opportunity for people to be heard. It also means that one no longer needs to earn the right to be heard, being judged by accepted standards or criteria. It used to be that, you know, if you wanted to you had something to say, you know, then, then there were certain standards. There were people who would kind of adjudicate whether what you had to say was worth hearing or not, right? But now anyone can say anything, do anything alike. And, and, and on the one hand, we see that there's something positive about that. If there was a system in place that was elitist, you know, if you were, if you were only allowed to uh, 
you know, say something because you fit somebody's standards, and that could be obviously a negative thing, right? It didn't allow for the voice of the, the you know, the, the general population to be heard. But the opposite side of that is that, is that there's now no criteria. You can say whatever you like, and there's no one judging, no standards, or at least it, the standards that are there end up becoming these silly arguments all the time, and so on. And so we're raising kids who think that they should always be at the center of attention because they've been exposed and promoted on Facebook by their parents or whoever and then encouraged to do the same for themselves. I mean, this is just creating more and more of a culture of narcissism, just feeding into what is already there, but it's getting worse. And yet, if we just step back for a second, we could see that so much of it in this social media universe is a cry to not be ignored or forgotten. But surely that impulse has always been there, even if social media is not. Um, I have to be careful where I say this. I'm looking around. But, uh, you know, I've been in lots of churches. In fact, I've pastored a church where um, people used, um, uh, they often would hold institutions hostage by offering large sums of money just uh, then so their name could be sort of put on a plaque or in a window somewhere in the sanctuary. I remember being held hostage by such a family when I first arrived at a church that I pastored. And so we find ways, we used to find ways to make sure that we were remembered. Monuments to people's egos and insecurities are somewhat harder to erase from those old days. At least with social media, it's just a couple of clicks and you can get rid of them. But uh, although that's hard too. And why do we do it? Well, the psalmist has some, something to say about that. The psalmist knows that life is short. Psalmists articulate this well in another place in Psalm 103. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over and its place knows it no more. You find a lot of that kind of thinking in, in the Psalms at times. It's like our life is short. It goes quickly when you look at the big picture. But we try to make our mark. But it's rare that we are peace, at peace with it, right? With the mark that we've tried to make. And so faced with this, the writer of the 25th Psalm is crying out to God in prayer. Asking for help. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you in a Psalm series this summer? Is that right? Okay. I'm preaching a couple of places this summer, and I knew one of the congregations in a psalm series. It's good. It's a good thing to do. Um, Anne Lamott uh, has a book out, uh, called, um, I like the title of this book, Help, Thanks, Wow, The Three Essential Prayers. If you want to boil prayer down to three things, it's help, thanks, and wow. And this psalm is one of these help kind of prayers. And, and, and psalms, there's many psalms that fall into this category. They give us ways to pray in the most basic situations of life when we don't know what to say. The psalms make us articulate in the language of prayer that flows out of our deepest experiences. And this psalm, in many ways, is a help psalm. It begins, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Don't let me put, be put to shame. Don't let my enemies exult over me. It ends by expressing the same cry. I'm lonely. And afflicted, relieve the troubles of my heart. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my foes and their violent hatred of me. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all its troubles. And so these verses frame this psalm. And it's important when you're studying or thinking about a psalm. How, how, what is the structure of the psalm like? And, and, uh, and so we see these verses framing the psalm. They're cries for help. But they, they frame what at the center of the psalm is a very important word. Well, actually, sort of inside that frame are a couple more requests. And they are to ask God to, to help us uh, to find the way. There's lots of language about the way or the paths that we should go. Make me to know your ways. Show me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you I wait all day long. But it's at the center. All this, this kind of longing, these cries... Uh, for help, and then a cry for a way to go kind of point us to the center of the psalm. And here we hear these words. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. 
for your goodness sake, O Lord. There it is. That deep impulse that has been expressed in so many places. We hear the psalms of pop music. How many of you remember from the Breakfast Club, Simple Mind song, Don't You Forget About Me? Great pop song. But that impulse, that deep human cry, don't you forget about me. It's there. We're not sure we're, that we're going to make it, so that's why we do what we can have people remember the good things we do. We want to somehow be assured that we haven't lived this life in vain, that we've made a difference, that we've counted for something. And that impulse in and of itself is not bad, but I wonder if the psalmist sees that, and in the end it's an attempt, that the attempt to be remembered by the world is a cruel and heartless game. Some of you may remember uh, last year, I don't know if any of you are uh, U.S. college football fans. I'm, I'm not particularly, but it's, uh, it's a religion down there. And um, some of you might remember the story around Joe Paterno and Penn State, one of the most famous college football coaches, an icon. And, um, and there was stories of sexual abuse that happened amongst some of the players because of one of the coaches. And the accusation is that Joe Paterno knew about it but didn't do anything. He was guilty of that. Well, there was a huge statue or a statue of Joe Paterno at Penn State. Big bronze statue. And if you remember the story, they pulled it down. That was, um, that was hard for a lot of people. And uh, the memories of football supremacy and excellence now tarnished and tainted. The sins are exposed. The damage is devastating. The wind passes over and its place knows it no more. <laughs> Psalmist knew that these things would happen to football coaches and to ministers and to people just like you and me all over the world. The psalmist, and I suspect Job, whom we heard earlier, was in a similar situation to the psalmist, cry out to God in despair knowing that one day all who know them will pass away and that their achievements will not be remembered. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? That one day no one will remember anything you've ever done. Job and the psalmist know the futility of trusting in what will only return to dust. He knows the futility of trusting in those shrines of remembrance that we erect in our lives and to ourselves and in our churches and in our communities. And it's in light of these sobering realities the psalmist turns to this prayer. According to your steadfast love, remember me. And I want to suggest that what holds that space together, the tension between wanting to count for something in this world, but realizing that in the end it will all disappear the one thing that's going to hold that together is the divine memory, the memory of God. Not our memory of God, God's memory of us. And it is God's memory of us which makes it possible for us to neither abandon our sorrow nor to surrender our hope. And it is God's memory which gives a boundary to our despair, to our hopelessness, to our cry for help, our dislocation. Think about what the scriptures say. It's the memory of God who remembered Rachel and filled her barren womb. It's the memory of the God who heard Israel groaning under the burden of cruel slavery. And the scriptures say he remembered his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the memory of the God who heard the desperate cry of the frightened thief on a cross and who made a promise to accompany him even beyond death. God is a rememberer. Not in a sentimental, sloppy way, writing diary entries of the good times we had together. Rather, according to his steadfast love, is what the psalmist says. And this seems to me to mean that in God's powerful, reconciling, and redemptive, covenantal love, we are somehow seen in a different light. We are seen as having a significance in the universe, but not with us in the center of it, because that's the difference, right? 
in, the, in our trying to construct monuments to ourselves that other people would remember, we are at the center. But here in this text, God is at the center. And it's only because God is at the center that we are then remembered. And we are, are partners in God's energies and purposes of reconciliation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this morning? To anyone who first heard this story, and you've heard it, but maybe we need a fresh hearing of it today. A God who remembers us? Surely the idols and the deities of the day were not concerned with human affairs other than to capriciously bless or curse them. But a God who in his love remembers us? What kind of God is this? What kind of God doesn't count our transgressions and hold them against us? What kind of God takes our sins and remembers them no more? And is this remembering just to putting them in the trash and then hitting click? No, it is something different. It is a redeeming of who we are and of our actions and our lives. It is a transformation of them. It is that promise that we hear that in Christ God is making all things new. Jesus shows us this God. The thief says, remember me. Jesus doesn't say, why? What have you accomplished? What have you done for me lately? He doesn't say that. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that amazing? This is brilliant news for those of us who have lost our memories. And for those of us who live with those who have lost their memory, it's a horrible thing. Isn't it? When you live with someone who is losing their memory. But it announces that our dignity and our hope and our humanity are not to be found finally in the moments we've constructed to ourselves or our ability to remember and to love, but rather in the promise of the one who both remembers and loves and who does so beyond the boundaries that death itself would seek to build. And so hear this now. When pain torments our bodies, when unwelcome fantasies invade our sleep, when friends unite to condemn or to abandon us, when death hovers in our doorstep, then it is not finally a kind word or a resolve that we need, but rather an encounter with the God who remembers us and who remembers that we are dust, but who in the cry of the psalmist remembers that our history is not something that can be discarded and who in Jesus Christ enters into the boundary of our dislocation, and he proclaims that we are not forgotten. The reason for our hope is that we are remembered in life. We are remembered when disaster engulfs, we're robbing the life of joy and peace. We are remembered in our graves. And the reason for our hope is we are remembered by God when all other memories have dried up, when all has passed away and creation itself is undone. Indeed, the pictures of a new heavens and a new earth where God, in his great memory, brings everything back together into its fullness, into his dream for all creation. As I said, my dad is not doing well these days. And one of the things that we've been doing in these last days is that we've been getting together and we've been getting him to tell us stories from his past. And... Uh, some of you know I'm, I'm planting a, a new little Presbyterian mission in uh, downtown Guelph. And one night our little uh, church had a storytelling night where we invited everyone to bring a picture of themselves from their youth, so somewhere up to five years old. And, and, and we're just going to tell stories to each other about who we are, getting to know each other better. And so I went, I went to, um, uh, I got some pictures uh, from my dad. And, and I was just kind of looking at them and I and I asked him, I, I said, you know, I said, Dad, was I a happy kid? And he said, yeah. He says, you were a pretty happy kid. And, you know, I don't know if I can convey how much that meant to me. That my father was and is holding these memories of me in his heart, in his mind, even in these last days, that I was a happy kid. And to be remembered by him like that right now makes me think and hope that this is something that will forever be his, holding his son and his memory with fondness. In your love, remember me. And I somehow believe that our Heavenly Father will do the same. 
whether we were happy children or not. I'm sure lots of us have, if we ask that same question to our parents, we might not get the same answer. But even if we weren't, that we would know our true identity, that God, our Heavenly Father, would know our true identity, has known it, does know it, and that our desire to be deeply loved and to have our essential humanness cherished, that the flaws and the terrible waiting of so much of our lives for bad news, for good news, for no news, that all of this is being redeemed. In your love, remember me. And finally, in Jesus, the crucified God, we hope together with those outside of this place who do not share our hopes and with those whose hopes for this life remain unfulfilled, for those who are disappointed and indifferent, with those who despair of life itself and with those who have been the enemies of life, perhaps like those thieves on the cross, and with those who, for whatever reason, have abandoned all hope. In and with Christ, we hope and remember them before God. I think that's important. That as we think about how we go to live out this gospel in the world, that we would be those who would hold our neighbors and our friends and the, the ones who are broken and, and who do not have this hope in Christ, that as we hold them in our hearts that, and bring them to God, that God would remember every beloved creature and in remembering that it would be all of our hopeful end. Amen. Thanks be to God for his memory of us today and of his word to us.